Thank you. <laughs> Bit of support from the armories. Right, thank you. Um, my, my name's um, Martin Knight. I'm, I'm not an academic uh, in this field, um, but I am kind of obsessive, compulsive, collectory thing. <laughs> Um, that leads to a, a, a lot of research and a lot of um, pain and boredom from my wife because every time we go anywhere, she says, what is it that's there? Why are we going? So that's me. Um, I just thought a bit, a bit of a, an anecdote. Um, I've been taking some of these weapons because if you do collect these things, you'd have to say these days there is a very high risk that what you are collecting is something which has been fabricated in Eastern Europe by somebody who's quite professional, etc. So I also engage in looking at the, the archaeology of them, what are they actually made of, what can you tell about how they've been constructed. So that's partly to protect me, but it's also to find out about how things have been made, how they've been used, what more information can you find out about. That involves transporting swords around, and occasionally <laughs> you get stopped. <laughs> um, I've been doing that for quite a few years, and it was only the other day um, at Victoria Station that a very nice police officer came up to me and said, excuse me, we couldn't help but notice you're carrying a gun bag, and we want to work out if there's something offensive in it. And I'm thinking, oh, swords, does that count as offensive? Am I going to spend the night in jail? Apparently... Guns bad, swords perfectly okay. Um, until I said my name was Knight, at which point I could th he was thinking, "Are you taking the proverbial?" <laughs> and then I explained, "No, no, that's the reason why." So, um, what I thought I would do is just show you a few examples of um, weapons from that period. But primarily, it will have to be swords. I just found I couldn't. Uh, pole arms just too big and too dangerous to have around. Um, so focusing on swords and look at how they evolved across the period. We've already had a couple of talks on arms and armour and how they have evolved. And Tom has already made some um, observations on the way swords have changed. But what I'll do is look at some specific examples of items from um, each period and let you understand uh, what they can tell us about how they were made, how they were <coughs> used, how they might have been adapted. Um, maybe if we've got time, a bit about um, stuff that's going on in the area of finding out more about their construction um, and more about their origins. Um, so, if, hands up, uh, any people around here not familiar with the anatomy of swords? N no one's going to put their hand up. So, I just thought I'd just put up, um, uh, of, I've got the luxury of a pointer, um, a, a, a brief one here. Um, steel blade, double-edged in this case, with a groove, a fuller, uh, down the centre. That's to lighten the blade, it makes it more flexible, makes it more responsive, and it's not as heavy. It has nothing to do with blood and all that kind of stuff. Um, this piece, the cross, to protect your hand, obviously, so if somebody's slashing at you, you've got some protection there. Um, the blade is extended by the tang. Now, I don't actually know with medieval swords, because I haven't sort of like taken them apart and gone, well, let's have a look at this, whether the, the tang would have been welded, hammer welded, onto the shoulder of the blade and would be iron. That would be what you would see in the 19th century. But I'm sh it's just an extension it's of... An extension of well, it's I've learned something, that's good. Um, that would be topped with a pommel, which is basically your counterweight, so that you can make that fairly responsive. Um, if you're going to basically rivet it on, you need some kind of rivet mounting, and in most cases you'll find that that will stand proud. It could be a, a, a separate piece, so I'll show you examples of that. Um, and that will effectively hold your grip in place. Um, the important thing about... Um, a particularly hard thrust swords, or so on thrusting swords, is the concept of an area of the blade which will suffer minimum vibration, minimum twist at the point of impact. So that, if you like, is the sweet spot that anyone using a sword would instinctively know that's the bit you hit somebody with to transfer maximum amount of energy. 
Um, I do have a slide on that, but quite frankly, <laughs> what you could basically say is if you took a, a, a solid bar and suspended it on the wire, if you hit it well below um, the centre of percussion, it would pivot around the centre of gravity and it would move that way. If you hit it above the centre of percussion, you would find that the forces of that rotation are countered and that actually it will travel that way. What does that actually mean? Um, if you take a, a blade, um, I've got some post-it notes tomorrow. I might, might do this with post-it notes on. If you give it a good bang there, you will find there is a point on the blade, and this one's quite a flexible one, so it's a little difficult to see, where that oscillation ceases and then it begins again. And that's your centre of percussion, that's where you would instinctively, you know, that's where most energy will be transferred when you make contact. Um, so I think, moving swiftly on, um, people have been through the development of armour. Um, so really looking at the period up to Cressy, you're looking from the transition from male with uh, leather knee cops, male possibly with our knee cops to gutter plates, etc., etc. people have been through that, which is fine. What I would say is, go and see some of these churches. That's absolutely fantastic. That's full size. It's enormous. And it's a wonderful brass. And he's right next to him, so you get the benefit of uh, both periods. So, plates developing, um, what you actually need is a solution for dealing with that. Um, and at this period, there's, there's two ways of doing it. There's cut and thrust swords. I don't happen to have one like that. That sword belonged to this chappy here, Can Grande della Scala, um, who was Lord of Verona. Um, what it does show is this is uh, a coat of plates that came through an auction house in Germany, is now in the museum. Um, you can see how it's been constructed and it would, would have been riveted perhaps onto a, 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 a linen ground or whatever. Um, but it would be built up with padding on both sides in this case because you can see it's got these armorial arms on there, the scaligeri arms. And it's like a huge great padded flat jacket. So any blunt force trauma against that is going to be quite well dissipated. So that's the kind of... Um, the high end of um, equipment at that period. Um, his sword um, is very much cut and thrust, so it would offer the option for thrusting. Um, this sword, um, is an alternative solution. So, um, yes, you can cut and thrust, but actually thrusting has to be kind of quite precise and if you're cutting with a, a relatively short sword it's relatively light you're going to deliver much less energy than with a big sword and quite a lot of momentum. Um, strictly speaking um, Oakshot classifies these as what is it 13B and it's a it's a single-handed sword to me it's pretty much it's single-handed or hand and a half. Um, you could deliver quite tremendous shearing force with that but if you look at the profile of the blade there's the center of percussion so you've still got quite a bit of metal there as you get towards the tip it's a very very slim lenticular section so you could deliver quite deep slashing blows with that on soft armor and flesh basically so you, you're still dealing with a, a slashing sword but one that could also be used to live a blunt force trauma through mail. Um, is it too good to be true, is it? <laughs> Was it made recently? So, uh, let's go back. Um, I quite often go to um, Alan Williams um, at the uh, Wallace Collection, and he's only a metal we have a chat about balance of probability so all i could say is that sword blade 
has been made of a moderate quality steel with slag inclusions, um, but it's not a brilliant steel. Um, yeah, it looks like quite a high status weapon, so why, why that steel? Now, that might be it's not the real deal. It might be that it's to do with where that weapon was actually made and the technology that was available at the time. Um, so I'll come on to that a bit later. Um, I'll highlight it up there. Um, weights 1.6 kilos. I tend to work in pounds and axes because I'm an old dude. Um, and I also record things in inches because you know, the inch, the pouce, was how a lot of these things were measured in the first place. And it's valuable to me to be able to make comparisons uh, along those lines. So, um, the other way of trying to date something is can you compare it with something you know the date of? Um, and we're really reasonably sure about this saw, which is in Cologne, same style of blade, same style of hilt, or in this case it's got uh, an insert on both sides. But you will notice this disgusting, <laughs> this gap here and that strange bauble. Um, it should, in theory, really have a, a tang button rivet piece that looks like that, um, which is what you've got on, on this piece, is a kind of pyramidal, um, in this case, iron um, tang button. Um, but it appears that what has happened here in the, uh, I think, the 17th century, it's been disassembled, the hilt has been recovered, or the the leather has been re-stretched over the hilt, and somebody's put it on the wrong way. That should taper up to the, the hilt. So it's been through a process of, of change, but it gives you an idea of what sorts of that period would look like. The next thing I looked at is, well, hold on a sec, what is this medallion that is contained um, in the hilt? So iron hilt. Being gilded, it's been plated with copper first, so presumably it's been immersed in uh, copper sulphate and then it's been mercury gilded. If I could get it XRF tested, that would prove that. Um, I was looking at it with um, David Edge the other day and he pointed out in his right there are also traces of silver. So then that kind of raises the issue, well, you know, how would that have been produced? Because there, there is a case for um, you could mechanically plate this with silver, but there's no evidence of any cross-hatching or anything like that. Um, you could plate it with silver and then plate it with gold, um, or you could use copper ground and then uh, mercury gild it. So maybe this has been gilded on more than one occasion. Um, the fact that the blade is relatively pristine, I mean, there are some deep pits in it, um, the fact that there is some damage there. The tang has been damaged. Something has happened at some point in time. Maybe this medallion has been incorporated into that and then it's been put to one side. Or maybe it's a fake. But we're <laughs> so I, I'm still kind of investigating uh, more about these pieces to make sure um, that I'm kind of reasonably comfortable they are uh, the genuine article. Um, but if along the way I find evidence that they're not, then to me that, that's valid evidence as well. So, for instance, only the other uh, <laughs> few months ago, I was looking at a very nice handgun, um, which looked very plausible um, and appeared to have been made in the correct way for late 15th century. It had traces of uh, a red outside paint. It looked like it had come out of a Nuremberg collection and reappeared. Um, and I took that to Alan and boom, modern rolled steel. And the reason I took it to Alan was I thought, I'm sure I've seen something like this before. And the answer was there's a castle in Prague with a handgun, with the same tiller, and I measured the dimensions and it was exactly the same. But what are the chances of that? Zilch, I <laughs> think. So straight off, get the testers, etc. That's gone back where it came from. I don't even want to know where it came from. Um, but you do have to be exceedingly careful. Now, this uh, medallion is a uh, copper gilt um, with what appears to be green enamel on it. It's been pierced from the inside out. That's why I'm calling it a medallion. 
but it's fairly crudely pierced and it's kind of pierced off centre, so it wasn't made for that purpose. So I kind of wonder whether it was some kind of plaque, maybe on a, um, a casket or something like that. Um, that emblem, the only example I can find of a green cross flurry in any heraldic form is from, uh, and uh, now you sort of suspend disbelief, is from an order of Templars um, who uh, started in Portugal. And when the Templars were suppressed, this particular order was protected. Um, they used a green cross flurry, but literally on a white ground. It's appealing to think, well, maybe that could be uh, the link. Um, certainly the green, the gold, and the palmate decoration would say it's either Iberian, or if I saw that in Sicily, I, I would not be at all surprised. Maybe it just reminded the owner of the sword of something, and he thought, well, OK, I resonate with that, I'm going to have that. Maybe it belonged to somebody he knew. Um, maybe it was carried as a medallion temporarily. Um, but it's now been in, set in the pommel. Um, connection there with, if it is Spain or Portugal, uh, one of the things Alan did was he was allowed to um, do some uh, metallurgical analysis of blades, admittedly by just polishing the surface. And in Windsor Castle, there is one of, no doubt, numerous um, swords of El Cid. Um, now, what you could really say is it's probably Spanish. It's, it might be 1400s, whatever. But the quality of the steel is pretty poor. So, I don't know, maybe that's a regional thing. Um, speculation on my part at the moment. So, moving on... Um, I'm conscious I'll have to speed up now. Um, one of the things I've also uh, been doing is um, talking to a, a, a guy from the Portland Hospital um, called Robert Hill, and he's using CRT scanning to look at artefacts and try and determine um, how they've been constructed, what you can find out about um, how they've been made. Um, one of the interesting things he's doing if you're into um, Viking swords, for example, he's looking at the taper, the angle of the taper on blades, yeah. okay. and he's comparing blades, uh, like off bared blades, to look at is the taper consistent? Did the man who make them always taper them the same way, etc.? Um, he's looking at how hilts have been constructed, three part hilts, etc. Um, so he's done this for me. You can see there that that. Uh, copper plaque is set into a ring. There is a void beneath it, which would be consistent with um, what I've seen with evidence of other pommels like that, bronze pommels that have been hollowed out to take something like that, which I'm <coughs> missing. Um, you can see the tang through there, and you can see how that's aligned uh, through the hilt. I can't see any made in Poland yet, or anything like that, but uh, who knows. Um, gilding. Uh, gilding on iron, um, it's not that uh, uh, common in surviving pieces, but this is a, um, a spur that belongs to me. Um, I got it like that, uh, in excavated condition. Um, it was basically cleaned back. I suspect, again, that has been mercurial gilding. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me, but the reason for that is, if I look at that checky pattern, it's quite a lazy line. It's almost as if, if you had coated it with a paste as opposed to with leaf, um, that would be kind of the profile that you get. Um, but without XRF, I'm speculating. So really, that would be a plea if anybody's got an XRF <coughs> facility. I'd like to have a look at it. Um, Right, moving on, next phase, um, we're getting to almost complete plate. Um, this effigy of Edward of Woodstock, um, Canterbury Cathedral, I'd say well worth a visit. They are very accommodating. Um, I said to them, uh, sorry, I'm really interested in swords and you can't see the sword from the side that you normally get a view of, so I was allowed to uh, climb up step ladders and have a look, etc. What you can see there is, uh, because plate has developed to such an extent, you've got a very long, thin thrusting sword. 
So something akin to that. Now this is not of that period. If it was, it would have a very, very acute point, and this is more of a spear point. Um, I'll come on to that later. But what you've got is, is basically um, a flattened diamond section, which, yeah, I mean, there's a centre of percussion there, but if you hit somebody with that, you're not going to deliver a lot of kinetic energy, per se. Um, so really, it is more designed for thrusting. Um, you could still obviously hit somebody with that, but, but the angle there on, on the bevelled edge is so great that it's not going to inflict deep cuts. However, it does have hand and half grip, much like um, the one on Edward. Um, and if you look there, I think this is more likely to be um, 15th century. Um, in Italy, um, heavy horse, very popular. Um, you need a solution really for dealing with Italian plate. Um, and a very acutely pointed tip is not going to last that long. So if you want something more spear point to wedge in between plates, that's a possible solution. But then again, that could well be uh, a rapier blade that's been remounted in that. But it, just to give you an idea of the, the size and feel of a, a, a sword of that period. Um, you can see guys here um, using them two-handed. So there's a guy up here who's wielding one of those swords two-handed. He's got that right over his shoulders. He's about to deliver a massive blow. There's another guy over there doing that, and I'm not sure what's happening here with these. Um, but clearly they are using them uh, percussively, but that's all you would be doing is delivering blunt force trauma, and there's not a lot of weight to it, so I think it's not that profitable. However, this chappy here quite clearly is delivering a, a well-aimed thrust, and, and his opponent had to slide his head back to avoid it piercing uh, uh, the side. So good for thrusting, but not particularly good for cutting. Um, so another solution in parallel is the sword of war. Um, this, this one is Italian. Um, I think it actually came from a, um, a church. It's still technically, well, I guess you can hand and a half, but to me it's almost two-handed. Um, it has a lot of um, irregular uh, corrosion um, areas which look pretty much as though that might actually have been exposed to people who have been able to put their fingers on it because they're the shape of fingerprints etc so it may well be that that has been um, out in a, a church or a tomb or somewhere Sorry. like that <laughs> yes, all right. um, what you have here is something that now weighs two kilograms <coughs> um, nearly uh, four and a half, five pounds. Um, again, I can see a lot of cuts around the centre of percussion, so it has been used for both cut and thrust. Um, people are already at the point that they're quite offensive weapons. You, you, you are not going to cut your hands to shreds um, doing this, especially if you're wearing gloves. Um, you can use the cross uh, to hammer into any part of the anatomy that you feel like, and the pommel which has now got lobes on it, is, is quite heavy and quite offensive itself. Um, what kind of damage could they deliver? So if you're dealing with people who are wearing mail and people who are wearing plate, if you're in plate, obviously you're better protected, but there's still going to be a lot of kinetic energy transferred through that plate if somebody hits you, and you could hit with great force with those. Um, I thought I'd use Visby as a, a, an example. Um, those are the walls of Visby. Poor old Gotlanders um, have been invaded by uh, the King of Denmark with a Danish army, which is fairly professional, and German mercenaries. So the chances are they are wearing plate by this time. But we know that the Gotlanders were wearing a combination of transitional armour, if you like. Um, there's an awful lot of evidence um, of male being cleaved through completely and skull split um, in situ. 
Um, and that's the kind of weapon that would do that. Um, very unfortunately, there's also a lot of evidence of legs being, lower legs being cut. Um, and the most recent studies that have been done, um, if, if you look at a sword like this that's been used, there are an awful lot of little nicks um, along the blade. And that's through contact with the edges of the other blade, which you will get in um, a fight. Um, and they've analysed the edges of cuts on, on main bones, on the tibia, uh, etc. And you can see score marks that have been made by a blade. So it's got, effectively it's got its own individual signature. So they can tell from that that a leg has been cut through and the foot on the leg next to it has been amputated in a single blow by the same sword. And based on the angle of the cuts, it seems unlikely it was done while somebody was on the ground. And the frequency with which it happened tends to indicate that that was um, a rather uh, mechanical practice by the, the German and Danish troops because they were trained, they were mercenaries, they knew what they were doing. Um, these guys might be reasonably well armoured um, above the chest, they might have had hauberks on, but less likely to have been armoured on the legs, so you cut the legs. Um, and there are examples of a 17-year-old, 18-year-old um, leg that has been hit five or six times. So it wasn't just, it was a horrible business of keep chopping, keep chopping, keep chopping, when they go down, stab, move on to the next one. Um, so apologies for the, the gore on that, but that was the, the practice of it. Um, what can you also find evidence of on swords? This, this one is Italian. Um, it's probably, let's say, 1350 to 1400. You might say 1380, I don't know. Um, it still has uh, an incised uh, inscription there in silver, IND, in nomine domini, in the name of the Lord. Um, Italy, very Catholic country. Um, perhaps if you were taking the heads off papal legates during an internecine war, it made you feel better that you were doing it in the name of the Lord. Um, the marking on there is a six, one, two, three, four, six petaled um, floret. Um, that's incised in Latin. Um, and it would be quite interesting to comprehensively inventory all the marks that we can and kind of work out, is there any pattern here? Are they makers' marks? Do they indicate a particular country, etc.? Um, a lot of museums are starting to record that information individually, but it'd be wonderful to get a comprehensive database, but then I'm a bit obsessive. Um, if we move on then to uh, full plate, 1400, 1420, say onwards, um, we can see uh, Thomas Lord Camoys, who commanded one of the rooms at Edwin Call there, um, clearly he's got uh, what looks like a cut and thrust sword with a circular pommel. Um, this chappy uh, dated back 1440, again we've now got a cut and thrust sword. Uh, we can see the kind of the quality of armour here and how comprehensively it covers the body. So you've got to a point where hacking at somebody with something like this isn't really going to, um, they're not going to take much notice of it. Yes, you can, you can stab, but what you really perhaps want is a more um, flexible solution. So we then start to see uh, cut and thrust swords with a flattened diamond section, but a broader blade, a shorter blade. So you've got to get closer to your opponent to use it. But if you're fully armoured, perhaps that's not an issue if you're a cool customer. Personally, I wouldn't fancy it. Um, and this is kind of like the state of armour you were getting to in the 1450s, so uh, Earl of Warwick, absolutely wonderful um, effigy. And he has an enormous great cut and thrust sword, and I've measured the cross on that, and I've, I've, I've yet to find something quite as ostentatious, but maybe that's part of the point. Um, so that's the kind of technology you're looking at. Um, there's an awful lot of those came from... Uh, Castle on Hoard, so a, a barge, allegedly, um, were sunk uh, in the Dordogne um, in the proximity of Castellon. Now, whether those swords came from Castellon or not, neither kind of here or there, 
they all seem to be from uh, around the same period, so they could date from about 1450 or earlier. Um, some of them are in superb condition, I've seen some of them. Um, you can divide them into a couple of groups, those with wheel-shaped pommels, uh, those with a much more acutely pointy blade and, and these uh, straight crosses with balls on the end, and a variety of pommels from fishtail, etc. Then you've got the one where we saw the picture of uh, the falchion, which has that kind of inverted pear shape, etc. Um, but they're quite iconic. Um, so if you have a look at this one, now, I really like this one. Um, it's excavated. It came from France. It was in appalling condition when I saw it, and I thought any sane person in their upline wouldn't touch it with a barge ball because it was covered in something. <coughs> um, and that something looked like a, a, a black paint. Uh, I talked to the person who was purveying it, and they said, oh, it's been in a fire. I was, uh, ooh, not, <laughs> not sure I like the idea of that. Um, is the blade still true? He misunderstood me and thought I was saying, are you telling the truth? And it all got a bit um, uh, emotional, but in the end he decided that it looked right. So um, I, I purchased it. It turned out that all this black gunge was actually, um, I had it tested at uh, Sussex University. Um, so you flown up your friendly physicist and say, excuse me, you do have an XRF. Could you have a look at this? Um, and it turned out to be a zinc-based paint, basically. So somebody had coated it in black paint, underneath which it was collecting moisture and causing it to rust. But when I cleaned all that lot off, what, what you find is quite a serviceable sword. It's quite light, um, it's quite flexible, it's still got quite a keen edge, it's got a whole variety of nicks on it. Um, so I went to visit uh, one William Marys in Preston next Faversham. Uh, fortunately, this is 1459, I think uh, yeah, he died. Um, and had a look at that because what he's got is a, a pommel there with a a little pip in it um, and just for a satisfy my curiosity I took a copy of the, the brass rubbing blew it up and put this over it now that's with a wide angle lens so it doesn't look quite as, as neat but it's a like 100 percent match now all that says to me is you didn't have this or another sword exactly like it it's about proportion and the medieval sword maker's sense of proportion and how broad the cross would be in relation to the length of the blade, the length of the hilt, etc. Um, so that kind of backs that up. Um, the profile is now more of a flattened diamond section, so I don't know if you want to fill the edge on that. I, I think that would do you some serious um, uh, damage. Um, so it is quite good. I, I thought they wouldn't be that good for cutting, but I'm now convinced they would be. Um, so being a bit of a nerd, I did, <laughs> I counted all the cuts, etc. and I can work out that, uh, in theory, if you look around the centre of percussion, there is a, a leading edge and a trailing edge to this sword. And that would ring true because the scabbards would be handmade. It would only fit in one way, and I know that from Napoleonic swords. If you, you've got a well-made scabbard, you can only get that sword in one way. Um, that the, the blade is slightly asymmetrical, so the scabbard would follow its contours uh, fairly precisely, which means you'd always pull it out one way, and that's the leading edge, and that's got far more cuts on it. Um, but what's also interesting is it has been honed around there, so it's been sharpened through loose to get rid of some of those nicks, but there's also an area there which is being honed. Um, and I've seen that on the Napoleonic sabres, which I used to collect, and that's literally people chopping billets. You don't use the business end, you use a higher part of the blade, and quite often you, you will find a sabre, for example, that has a, a neat little curve in there. Um, probably drove the, uh, the purveyors of arms mad that people did that. Um, the other thing I've noticed is if I compare it with uh, a whole variety of other swords of the same type, um, they're fairly consistent in terms of um, size and length. Um, some of them are a lot heavier, and I can show you an example in a bit that is heavier. But I suspect that this might be 
earlier than the Castellon swords. And the reason for that is the cross is very light. The blade is not fully recessed into that cross. Now, I've seen that sword. That's the same case from Alexandria. And that's actually dated 1417. You can tell that because that's when it was um, entered into the arsenal. There's another sword in the Wallace collection, dated to the roughly the same period. Same feature, the blade is not recessed into the cross. So if anybody's got any other examples of swords like this with blades that aren't recessed into the cross, please let me know. I'd we'll like to come around and have a look and see if there is something there, if you like a pattern. Um, this style of cross with this little custom sticking out the middle, um, developed around that period but it's not yet fully recessed um, there's a lot of stuff about swords like this saying well pff, that's an English sword I don't think so it's found in France it's northern European it could be French um, because it's quite light it also might be non knightly I don't know um, I've done a um, some work with uh, Peter Jonsson who's a, a very well known modern swordsmith and even more obsessed about swords than me um, and he's looked at the proportions etc and confirming how these swords were, were, were designed. Um, this is another example which is next door. It's much much heavier, the cross is much more defined and larger and the blade is recessed uh, into it but essentially it's performing the same um, task, it's both cut and thrust and maybe about 9mm on the point has disappeared from that because it has been rammed into a piece of armour incredibly hard um, interesting um, indications of how this was made um, it's not made in two halves which was my first kind of ooh, I'm not sure about this um, the, the blade has been let into the cross and there's a, a chunk of arm which has actually popped out of there so was the maker too enthusiastic in digging that channel? Maybe. Um, could have popped out at a later date. But did it actually matter? Um, possibly not, because if we go back here, um, it was very popular by then to have a rain guard in leather over that area of the cross. So you wouldn't, A, you wouldn't notice it, and B, if materially it doesn't if impact the use of the sword, then it's not an issue because um, I've got a very sort of iconic um, gothic sword which it took me a while to work out actually has a propeller twist in the blade and whoever made it it wasn't important because the blade is still true it's just a slight twist in it so there are a lot of things that a medieval maker might forgive that wouldn't be important to them but to us you'd sort of think oh I'd, I'd question that and maybe I'll have it replaced if it was sold to me. Um, moving on, um, this particular blade is uh, an improvement on um, that earlier one. Um, I, can't, I can't vouch for this. Uh, it's a Martin Sittick um, steel. There are slag inclusions in it, so you can see there. Um, the cross is made of iron. So that's kind of like what you would expect. Steel is very expensive. Um, making large quantities of it is very difficult, so you reserve the steel for the blade. It might be that that particular blade has um, a steel layer on the outside and a, an iron core. Short of cutting it in half, um, you can't really know. But certainly the quality of the steel is better by then. So the last thing I wanted to come on to, and I'll try and skip through this quickly, was um, the Um how do you know what a falchion actually looks like? There are some very, very bizarre, um, exaggerated pictures, but those tend to be associated with uh, bad people, evil people, etc. So it's almost like a signal of, like uh, the idea of a bastard. So it's unusual. Um, therefore, you give somebody uh, an horrendous-looking implement in the manuscript. Um, this particular um, carving here. Uh, shows Herod Antipas with John the Baptist and I think that is Phasalis who was his first wife 
he divorced her for the mother of Salome, and we all know what happened to John the Baptist after that. Um, but the point here is that the people who are bad have had their faces darkened, so it's not a racial thing, it's just an indication to the public consumer, if you like, that these are evil people, and they're carrying falsions. So again, the idea of something abnormal, unusual, seems to be used um, in art in that context, and the falsions quite popular there. However, we do have examples of them. So they were definitely uh, in use, and they were definitely effective. Um, Conyers' falchion is fairly early, um, and that's a very broad blade indeed. Um, Thought falchion, I can come on to in a bit, um, is more of a like a sabre almost. So I could recognise that from an Hungarian sabre um, with a clip tip. Um, <coughs> You then have uh, a different type of um, falchion down here. So I think there are three types. There's this cleaver type. There are these two sabre types, of which the armouries has one. And there's this type, which is entirely different. And the reason why it's different is that back is flat. And that tip is highly reinforced. And the cutting edge is there, not where you would think it would be. Now, when you look at them in art, they do appear in art, and there seems to be some disagreement amongst the artists as <laughs> which side is the cutting edge. That might be because they're not that common. Um, it could be that they were made in um, different forms. Um, that is the Conyers sculpture. The, the, the cross there is actually copper, so I think you have to shoot. It, it is um, purely a, a sword of tenure, um, so it was presented by the Conyers family to the newly incumbent bishop, who then gave it back to them confirming their tenure of their land. So the blade is perfectly usable, but the cross would be useless. Um, so that's not <coughs> the using any of This is one in Cluny, which is quite, uh, quite a lot smaller, but it does fit the belt. It would work. Um, and you do find them in manuscripts, and you have forced the conclusion they did exist. Um, they were practical weapons. Um, the second type, so the one that the armouries has and the thought falchion, may well have been inspired by uh, eastern sabres. Uh, people think that they came uh, back from the Crusades with that kind of idea, but um, at that point in time, uh, if you were talking Mamluks, etc., um, straight swords, not curved sabres. So um, the possibility is that they've been derived from that, um, and you do see them in art. So Holy Bible is one there. Very clearly, I mean, that's, that's very similar uh, to the Armouries one, uh, say for the, the pommel. And Southwall Jack, so right from uh, the early 1300s through to the end of, uh, towards the end of the 15th century. Um, that's the Thorpe Falchion. What's interesting about that one is bronze pummel, um, which has uh, a lot of foliage and uh, animalistic decoration on it. Um, no fuller. It has a very, very thin groove uh, down one side and one side only, and a shorter one down that face. Um, it's cut and thrust. It's beveled uh, along the edges. This. This is the cutting edge, so it is more like a sabre. Um, and it would be pretty effective, but the pommel suggests to me it's a reasonably high-status weapon. It's not, it's not a, your infantry-type piece. It's very well made. Um, and then we come on to this third and final type, and I'll let you go. <laughs> so we've then got this issue of um, a falchion with um, a cutting edge here with a flat back and a, a hugely reinforced tip so you can kind of work out that using it like that is going to be one of your main options you can see here now that could just be the artist but the way he has drawn that is that appears to be being used as the cutting face that's the cutting face that's the cutting face so there's artistic evidence that things like this existed. This one 
is still under investigation. Um, I've compared it to, uh, there's one in the National Army Museum in Delft, so I'm hoping to pop over there um, because my, my, my eldest has just got himself a, a, an MSc in Amsterdam, so <laughs> it's just an excuse for me to pop over there and have a look at this. Um, this version, uh, all I can tell from having talked to them very briefly is that that is the cutting edge. That side of the point is beveled, that side of the point is beveled, but not back here. So again, it follows that configuration, but it doesn't necessarily look like it's got a heavily reinforced point. That point is what is found on the uh, one in the Musée de l'Armée. Um, you're kind of also forced to the conclusion, if, th if that's right, um, that if you're going to be using something like that to pierce metal, because it's, it's not for plate, but it would do the job on mail. You've got to get quite close to somebody, therefore you're more likely to be armoured. And if you look at the um, hilt itself, what I can find is areas of cross hatching with silver plating, um, no evidence of copper, so it's been mechanically um, plated, which again might say it's a status weapon, or it might say there's a nice person in Hungary is manufacturing uh, silver plated hilts because you know, that technology is still around. Um, how would you use it? Well, these areas of mail are, are, are quite the, the obvious places that you would use to um, strike at. And oh, I don't know if you want to. So it's, it, it's, it's a reasonably hefty but quite compact weapon. Um, weighs about uh, three pounds, I think. Um, and you're forced to the conclusion that its primary objective is piercing mill. Uh, close up of the hilt. Um, one thing I did sort of think is that pommel, it's quite a well known style, but it's not flat at the base. And very many of them are flat at the base so that the uh, wood of the grip can be held against that quite easily. Um, however, you do get examples that are round. But again, I always gut these things and say, well, okay, what's wrong with it? Let's have a look at what's wrong with it. Let's analyze that and let's go further and further. Um, uh, the dilemma with that particular one is gonna be, um, do you clean that oil off? Because it's basically, that's an oil covering um, and have a look at the metallurgy. But once you've done it, you can't, readily undo it so um, in terms of uh, sizes I'm collecting dimensions on on these things um, I, I guess what I really would like to um, get out of this at some point in the future would be to be able to get access to different varieties of sorts have a look at the profiles map the profiles um, you could do it with um, scanning but that would be very expensive so I just you profile gauge and laboriously um, record it. Find out more about maker's marks by, by looking at what history we know about swords and collections. How do the marks um, compare? So if I went all the way back to uh, this one. There we go. Uh, that, that mark appears in the Eurotape shots, uh, records of the medieval sword underneath um, a sword which is in the Fitzwilliam collection. However, his narrative says, and this has uh, an incised mark, uh, like a dagger that's found on the Castellon swords, and he doodled this other mark while he was at it. Oh God. So, in the Fitzwilliam Museum, is there a sword with that on? Because he was doodling it while he was uh, cataloguing, or did he find it from somewhere else? So, the more we can find out about some of these things, the, the, the better. Um, it might help us work out whether there are um, particular areas that these marks come from. So that, that would be recognised in Germany, for example, as a Prince Bishop staff. I used to carry the uh, representation of the Eucharist at the top and they would have various flags and things hanging from it. So you could say, well, maybe that's German. Um, I don't know, but it would be nice to find out. So hopefully that's the flavour of swords of the period. Uh, they're in a room next door. They'll be there tomorrow. I've also got a small chalata in there, maybe about 1460. 
um, which has some interesting trays marks on it, which would suggest it's been impacted perhaps by areas, I don't know, but you can see the plate starting to craze. It does interestingly have a number of holes around it, which would suggest it did have some sort of crest on it. And I've got a very large kettle hat, um, and that's interesting to me. It is very heavy. It's not Victorian heavy, it's just heavy, because I've handled a few kettle hats from um, that period, and they are enormously heavy pieces but incredibly well protective so this is you know potentially infantry equipment and you can see on it an awful lot of impact marks on the left hand side and very little on the right which tells its own story etc um, so you're welcome to have a look at those and i'll let you get off now so. Any questions, you're welcome. Okay.